You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Hello and welcome to the Anxiety Podcast, episode 111. Have I got a show for you today? Today's guest is somebody who modeled his business on the X-Men. So if that doesn't get you intrigued, I don't know what will. It's a very exciting story and uh, he's doing inspiring stuff in the world and you're going to enjoy the conversation. You're going to enjoy how he kind of get, got aligned to his vision and his dream and we will go into more details on that in a moment when I give him his full formal introduction. Before I do so, other amazing news. Oh, it's just all so good. The Anxiety Journal, which I've been working on for months and months, is finally coming to a head. Um, the colours are going in there, the art's gone in there. All of the, the art in this book was actually done by one of the Less Anxiety, More Life community members. She's a very special lady and she's very talented and she's drawn all of the stuff for the book. So it's just the fact that you know, people who've helped me with this project of the journal are all people who are kind of from our world. It just me, it just feels so good. There's so much flow about it. You know, we're just, it just has a good feeling about it. Um, so anyway, to celebrate the fact, the pre-sale page for the anxiety journal is now available. You can go to theanxietyjournal.com. You can buy yourself a copy. There's a discounted price. There's free shipping. If you're in Canada and the U S um, and yeah, you can check out a bit more about what it's going to be about. But fundamentally, journaling has been a big part of my life. I've used it. I've implemented it. I use it with clients. Um, and I've just seen it become a big part of people's recovery in terms of how they set themselves up for a great day and how they recap their days and do all these wonderful things. So in the anxiety journal, there are tools to help you with anxiety. Now there are long-term tools for you to consider in the future. There's daily activities for you to do. So you're just going to love it in terms of how it can help you overcome anxiety. Um, and I'm just so excited because I've been working on this for a while and it started off with me in a blank word document and now it's looking beautiful. We've got all the art in there. We've got all the great questions in there and it's going to be a, a, just a wonderful physical product that you can carry around and use every day, which is so exciting. Um, so that's the anxiety journal while, whilst you're at the website, uh, anxietypodcast.com. You'll see a tab there for the journal, but there's also a free tab. So if this is all new to you, click on the free tab. You can get a few free things that I've put together, which will help you immediately start to feel better. And then if you want to get more into detail, there's also coaching and the online course. You can find all that at the website. I will let you explore and see what you can find. Um, and if you want to talk to me, you can also click the contact page and send me a message. Say hello. Um, also, if you want to find me on social media, you can go to at and then Tim J P Collins, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, not so much on Snapchat, but I'm working on it. Um, yeah, just connect up and say hello. Okay. This week's guest, Giovanni Marsico is a talent scout, curator, and connector of superheroes. God, that sounds good. He's the founder of Archangel, which is a private membership community of mission-driven entrepreneurs that are making the world a better place. And they do that through purpose-driven entrepreneurship and philanthropy. Um, Giovanni hosts an annual event, and he is also currently working on his next book, The Gifted Entrepreneur, which is coming out in September. He has a huge event in September as well in Toronto, which he'll talk about with some big-name speakers. We'll put links to the details of all this stuff in the show notes. Um, but he has a very exciting story, which I'm, I will shortly hand over to him to explain uh, about how he went from being anxious and kind of being on the wrong path to really totally aligned, so much so that he had a bliss attack. And I will let him explain what a bliss attack is in a moment. So without further ado, let's chat to Giovanni. Here we go. Okay, so Giovanni Marsico, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you for having me, Tim. Yeah, very excited. We've got some exciting news to talk about in your world, which we'll come on to a bit later on. Um, but before that, uh, I would love to talk about um, kind of your background, your history with anxiety and kind of how it's affected your life because you know it's it's been there for you in the background as you'll tell us about but um in terms of what you're doing these days i think it's just inspiring to see how far you can go from 
from kind of the dark days to now, you know, both making a difference and inspiring other people. So maybe you can just give us the, you know, the formative years for you, if you will. <laughs> sure. So uh, there have been some anxiety highlights, I guess, from the past. The, the, the first big one was in fifth grade when I was 10 and uh, moving into a new school. So I was a new kid and got made fun of and felt the, I guess, bullying for the first time, which was mm. challenging and difficult. And then that same year, my school did IQ testing and they labeled me as gifted. Right. And I thought, okay, that's cool. I didn't really understand. And then the kids in class would make fun of me for being smart, which I thought was really strange. Yeah. And it got to the point where that year, the, uh, some of them would gang up on me saying, well, stop doing so well on tests because you're making us look bad. Right. As is a new kid, you know, you're just trying to fit in. Um, and I, I'm happy that at the time I didn't listen to them, but it still felt like crap. Mm. Um, and, you know, fast forward uh, to, I guess, after high school where – or during high school, I started my own business hosting events for teenagers, like dance parties for, right. for raves. Well, uh, something like that. Uh, <laughs> I grew and, up in England, so we called it raves. I don't know if they were sure. called raves in Canada, but <laughs> yeah, well, there were raves, a little bit different. But yeah. we, you know, I remember after the first ever event, we had a thousand people show up, and my best friend at the time was my business partner, and we were at three in the morning just reminiscing, thinking, I can't believe. We just made money doing the thing we would do anyways mm. and, and the mm. thing we love to do. And I, I got home and, you know, my parents being parents said, well, that's awesome, but stop dreaming because you got to make sure you do well in school and get your grades and get a good job. And it was very, I guess, ego deflating. And that storyline of stop dreaming kept showing up. And, you know, um, at the end of high school, I already knew I was an entrepreneur. I've been running a business for a couple of years, which is hilarious. Mm -hmm. And my, my parents and guidance, actually my guidance counselors and, and teachers said, well, you're really good at math. You're really good at art. You're really good at science. Um, I'm like, yeah, yeah, but I want, I'm going to business school. And they said, no, you should get your, uh, get your degree in engineering and then get your master's in business because that's the smart thing to do. So, you know, I'm listening to them. I have no idea. And they're the professionals. They're supposed to guide me. That's why, it's, you know, they're a guidance counselor. Yeah. So I, I, I went to the University of Toronto for engineering, which is a really popular school for that. And in my second year, I realized I don't want to be here. The people who want to be here, they're ripping their hair out because it's crazy. And I don't want to be here. And that, that whole time, I was still hosting events and running the business on the side. So I dropped out and became a bit of a black sheep in the family because, you know, dropping out of university, most people don't even get that opportunity, blah, blah, blah. Um, and finally, I said, okay, fine, I'll stop doing these events and I will go to a different university for business, thinking that was smart. And then the panic started and the anxiety started. And that's literally... Um, looking back, I would label it as the first time I veered off path where mm. I wasn't aligned with what I was doing. Even though I was going to school for business, I, I stopped doing the thing I was passionate about, the thing I loved to do most. And it got bad. Like the, back then, this is when I'm, let's say, 20 or 21, I would have to take the subway to school. And there were days I couldn't even get off the subway because of the fear and panic I had. So I would ride the subway for three hours just and just not get off. Right. And my grades slipped and I just, it got to the point where I had to drop out. Um, and I couldn't understand it. And, you know, I went to go see a counselor and a therapist and just couldn't figure things out. Um, and then anxiety since that or after that point, it just kept showing up. It showed up in my relationships. It showed up in my marriage. I, I was married. Um, and, the worst panic attack I ever had uh, was right after my marriage ended. And it was so severe that I called the ambulance because I thought I was having a heart attack and literally didn't understand how bad these things can get. Um, and then I remember a month later going to see my family physician, telling him how depressed I was. And I, there was a day where I actually contemplated suicide. And I have a, a son, so I thought, okay, he's the reason I can't do this. So my, my doctor prescribed some kind of antidepressant drug, and I'm very anti-drugs, but I said, fine. And right after that appointment, I filled the prescription, and I went to go see one of my clients who was a friend of mine. His name is Chris Simpson. 
who runs a personal training studio. And he saw how distraught I was. And he said, he asked me what was going on. I explained the whole story. And he said, okay, let me see those pills. And he looks at them and he said, and he literally tossed them into the trash mm. and said, get your ass in the gym. And I feel like he totally saved me that day because my path could have kept veering off track. And he sort of put me back on track. And I, I did, from that point, everything started going up and up. But um, it led me into the real estate space. And we've talked about this because I, I think you know it well, where I got into real estate because I needed to make money. And a lot of people make um, career decisions based on the fact that bills have to be paid, or that's sort of the excuse at the beginning. And then the worst scenario to be in is to do really well and be really good at the thing you hate. Yeah. Right? Because now you're trapped and you, you start living a different lifestyle, and then you realize, well, I hate this, but I don't have a choice. And I gained 50 pounds or more. Um, and... I, you know, I was being featured in magazines as the top person in my industry and all this, all these accolades, winning all these awards. And literally I, I couldn't stand it. I wouldn't even, you know, most of my competitors would post this kind of thing on social media. I didn't, I didn't like it. What it afforded me though, was the opportunity to start going to events and meeting people at mastermind groups and conferences. And the spark happened where I, I discovered uh, my path again, where I really wanted to be hosting events essentially this time for entrepreneurs and, and specifically for entrepreneurs who want to make an impact and change the world and make it better. Uh, and I started hosting events in 2014, an annual mastermind event called Archangel Academy. And I felt the spark again that I hadn't felt since I was 20. And then after my second event, I was driving in my car and I had this experience where I can only explain it as the opposite of a panic attack. And I, I don't know what to call it, so I called it a bliss attack, where I felt like I had every positive emotion hit me like a lightning bolt all at once, where I just, I couldn't hold it, and I started crying, but joy, joyful crying, I had to pull over. And it was that day I discovered this really cool truth, that your body acts as a tuning fork. So when you, and this is my opinion, I guess, but when you feel or experience negatively charged emotions. It's like your body saying, this is not truth. You're not aligned Mm. and figure out why you're not aligned. And then when you experience positively charged emotions, it's the opposite. It's saying you're back on track. You're back on path. This is your truth. And the stronger the charge, the more aligned it is. And, you know, fast forward to this year, I quit real estate. All I'm doing is my archangel business. I have never been happier. I've never felt more aligned. All the people I've surrounded myself with are people I love. There's no, there aren't any battery draining type people, which is another big deal. Um, we could talk about that. And I've, I've like for the past 120 days, I felt bliss every day. It's hard to explain. And it might even sound a bit cheesy, but I, I don't even remember what anxiety feels like. And now it's more of excitement and more joy and bliss and happiness. And I feel completely aligned. I wonder for for people listening, when we think about kind of going off of the path and coming, because in your story, you kind of talked about how you left, you clearly left the path a couple of times when you went to business school and then when you went into real estate and each time you came back, you, you felt better. Um, so for people listening to this who are off of their path, what advice would you give them to to recognize that and, and to get more aligned? Cause it seems like you had an awareness of it at the time. I, I, well, I, I um, it's more Monday morning quarterback looking back. Mm. So, the, but the first thing I would say is your body knows way before your brain does. And your brain is actually your worst enemy. Sometimes your mind, because you create patterns based on um, trauma from your past and your brain just wants to keep repeating those patterns. And that's why a lot of people self-sabotage. They do the things that consciously they're wondering, why am I even doing these things? And it's because there is safety in your shit. And I apologize for swearing, but All right. uh, you know, when, when you experience a, something painful in your past, even though you don't want to feel that pain, your brain tries to repeat the pattern over and over again. And it's, it's part of the, fascination of, of the human condition because we we know better but we keep repeating the things and, and we repeat those things because they feel safe 
Yeah. So, for example, a bad relationship. Uh, you know, I met a woman where uh, her, let's say her parents were abusive. And then that translates, because it's uh, unconscious, that translates into relationships that you get into with, with your, let's say, boyfriends or husbands. And you don't understand why it's happening, but those patterns keep repeating until they become conscious and until you start working on healing that pain. Mm. So I mean, I'm really interested in the bliss attack um, because I've, I, I, when, I, when I hear you say that, I, f- I feel like some of the some of the physical symptoms may be similar um you know i've talked before about the the similarity between excitement and anxiety you know in terms of what's going on in our bodies with adrenaline and with an increased heart rate and all that kind of stuff and so i wonder whether physically a bliss attack might be doing the same things inside your body as a panic attack but your interpretation and where you're at in terms of alignment then it shows up in a completely different emotional way for you. Sure. Well, I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I see anxiety and excitement as the exact same emotion. It's, it's fear, mm. except the main difference is the perceived outcome. So with, with fear, or sorry, with anxiety, you have a negative perceived future outcome or a negative story. And with excitement, you have a positive future outcome, like riding a roller coaster. You know you're safe, but it's still scary. Um, and you can literally change the paradigm of any scenario because no matter what is happening, fear exists in the future, which is, it's not real. It's just your made up story of what could happen. Yeah. And part of the fun of all this is learning how to rewrite the story as if, as if you're a script writer for a movie and you know, most people are, are reactive or they're subconscious to this. They, they think life happens to them. And once you start realizing that you are the author of your story, you can start figuring out those patterns and start changing them. And, you know, I love when people say you have to be realistic. That word annoys me so much Mm. because your reality is the thing you create, whether you believe it or not, it's true. So you might as well start believing that it's a happy ending versus a drama. And that's what I've started doing for myself. And in terms of the bliss attack, um, I guess with panic, it's, it's adrenaline and cortisol. And, um, I, it kind of feels with a bliss attack that it's more dopamine and serotonin and all your positive, yeah, all the good ones jumping into your body at the same time in very high doses, maybe mixed with adrenaline, but, um, it's, it's the warm and fuzzies. You know what I mean? Like the, yeah. the really, the really good, uh, what are they called? Neurochemicals? I'm not sure the proper term, but. It's just a high amount of them. Yeah, and I think I thought it was really interesting how you talked about. I mean, um, well, coming from school, being gifted, but you talked about in in adult life being gifted at real estate um, and the concept of being gifted at something you hate. And I think more people experience this than are prepared to talk about because it would be seen as being people might perceive it as like egotistical or boasting or not being great not being grateful for what you've got but i too experience that myself and um in that in my life the things that i've put my effort towards i've generally been successful at um so when i was in sales i tried really hard i learned all the stuff i read the books and you know i was good at sales does that mean i was on my path and aligned absolutely not and i think that's a a good thing to just highlight and and help people uh, show people some awareness of it, is that just because you're skilled at something it doesn't mean it's you're on the right path right and having a gift is one variable or one aspect of the whole thing of alignment where the what i believe true alignment is is sharing your gifts with people you love doing work you love to do mm. right and when you have all of that that's when you really truly feel alignment. I was sharing my gifts, doing something I hated for people I didn't like. Yeah. And when I say didn't like, I'll, let me preface that. I To make it super simple, I believe there's in everyone's lives two types of people, the people who charge your batteries and the people who drain them. And you can you know which is which. And some people are super chargers and some people are super drainers. And in the real estate space for me, there were a lot of drainers. 
Uh, and in my, in Archangel, my new business, everyone is a supercharger. I literally feel more energized being surrounded by these people than I do before I see them. Yeah. If you can discover or uncover who these people are in your lives and surround yourself with more chargers and get rid of the drainers if possible, everything changes. And it's so hard to explain it. It always sounds woo woo. And I'm not that I'm not on the boo boo side, but it's fascinating how much more productive you can be, how much more energized you can be. And then how much serendipity shows up, mm-hmm. which is another one of my favorite things. And you know, it's there for everyone, but sometimes you're wearing blinders because you just don't recognize that this magic is happening. Or well, you're not open to it. Right. Yeah. And it, see, this isn't a slight against an industry. It's not about real estate because I know people in that field who are completely blissed out. They love it. It's their thing. And, and, and they're completely aligned. And then I know a lot of people who aren't, and we probably know 20 people <laughs> that we know uh, together mm-hmm. who start off in real estate and then they're doing something else because they discover their alignment. And, the, you know, I, I speak to a lot of people where they're doing one thing and the common phrase is, I feel like there's something missing. Yeah. Right. And they, they just they don't feel that alignment, but they're, they're they're in a fog and they don't know how to figure out what it is that they truly want to do. Yeah. And for me, it was uh, I mean. Our, our, our friend in common, Philip McKernan, actually <laughs> talks about uh, there's a big difference between a talent and a gift. So a talent might be, like I kind of said, skill, but something that you're very good at. You could be exceptionally good at it, but there's a difference between that and your gift, which is typically in some way helping or giving to other people. Um, right. And something I learned from Mr. Philip about anxiety, actually, is that a lot of times anxiety comes from being... Uh, self-focused right. where if you turn your energy and your focus onto the people you're serving it's almost impossible to have time to be anxious because when you're caring more about them you don't have time to care about your anxiety 100%. And that's, that's, that's an awesome uh, strategy I don't want to use that word strategy but it's an awesome way to get out of whatever current negative state of mind you might be in where you make it about the people you're serving. Yeah. He says, he says that all the time. It's not about you. And that's, you know, when I stepped on a uh, stage to do my one last talk with him, that was, you know, a, bit, a big part of it was the message is for one person in the audience that this resonates with. Turns out it resonated with a lot of people, but um, it kind of makes you feel uh, that you're just a conduit for a message. It's not about you and what you look like and how is your body language. I mean, all those things are kind of interesting and important to some extent, but mo- mostly it's like getting the message out there for for the benefit of other people. I mean, that's why the, this podcast exists and it's been a massively therapeutic and healing process for me, right? Um, so it's a perfect example. And I know that he teaches that uh, a lot of people have the misconception where you have to be perfect to be able to share your story. You have to be, uh, you know, if there's a before and after photo, you have to be the after person. Yeah. And it's totally not true because no matter where you are on your path, there's someone behind you. I, I, I like to think of it as a path model where you're walking down a specific path. There are people ahead of you on your path that, ha- that, may have more wisdom and you can, you know, take the wisdom from the people ahead of you and hand it backwards to the people behind you on your path. It's literally the easiest business model there is. Yeah. And it's totally uh, true and, and it works. Yeah. And that's what I read a post. I read a Facebook quote yesterday, which said, um, and I, somebody famous said this and I can't remember who, who to attribute it to, but they said, instead of practice what you preach, it's preach what you practice. Oh, I love that. I gotta write that one down. <laughs> right. Um, and, I, and that's what I'm trying to preach while I practice. I'm trying to, you know, I've, I've changed my life and I've changed, I'm trying to live a way which creates the most stability for me, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally. And, um, to be able to then pass that on to other people who have been through or are going through a similar struggle gives me, you know, huge amounts of pleasure. And it's like, it's worth me 
you know, guinea pigging things on myself because I'm like, if this works and makes me feel better, then other people are going to find it useful as well. So it's double win, right? I win and then I get to hand it off to somebody else and they get to try it out as well. Amazing. Yeah. So I'm interested in uh, when the, when you called an ambulance for your for your epic panic attack. What did what happened? What did they say? Uh, they came to my house and checked me out there, put me in the ambulance, and um, it wasn't until I, I arrived at the hospital that there was this really incredible nurse, um, this man who totally took care of me and. and was patient and tried to explain what was really happening in a way that didn't make me feel like there was something wrong. Mm. Uh, and I, you know, I wish I remembered his name, but he totally helped and was an angel for me that day. And, you know, part of the problem with that kind of panic attack is you have exponential fear of thinking what's going on and you don't want to die. And it almost feels like death, right? Yeah. So, I was able to get out of that that day. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's interesting. And as you said, as you got into your real estate journey, I'm kind of, uh, what, what woke you up? Would you say to the fact that you were clearly off your path? Was it that you start again exposed to some of these personal growth type experiences or what, what happened there? Because when I first met you, you were still well entrenched with real estate. That was probably three or four years ago at this point. Yeah, when we first met, which I think was at a Philip event, uh, at the time I had just started the Archangel Project. Right. And I, 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 before that, I was in a complete fog and and completely blind to this whole paradigm that there is anything different. I just figured life is like this, and you just got to deal with the cards you've been dealt and, you know, I'm making money, so I should shut up that kind of idea. And then I started, I think the key was surrounding myself with people who are like me, people who have the same heart or, um, who are like hearted, I guess is the right way to say this. And you realize, you know, cause a lot of times people feel like they're an alien, right? You, uh, you feel like no one else gets you. So you, you try to fit in and, and, you do what you think is right. And then you, for me, I started meeting other people who shared the same dream of the future, shared the same passion, were on a similar path. And when you surround yourself with people like that, it brings out the bliss inside you, right? You, you know, there's that cliche saying that you're the average of your five closest friends. And if you don't like who you are, change your friends. Yep. It's totally true. It's totally true. So when I started, I, and we, I found communities in my city of people, um, and that's one of the beauties of um, social media and, and sites like Meetup or wherever you can find people who are who have the same, I guess, values as you and the same heart as you and the same vision as you and the same dreams and the same idea of a, of a bigger future. It brings out the, the your superpowers. And if you can live a life where that's all you're surrounded by, it is game changing. Yeah. More bliss attacks ensue. <laughs> a lot more. Yeah. No, I've, I've like absolutely seen that in my life and seen through changing my, and, and actually for me, real estate was a stepping stone. I got exposed to, you know, these types of people who were, First off, people who'd read the four hour work week, people who'd read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and they were at least looking for some kind of freedom, which for me was like a stepping stone onto freedom plus alignment plus giving back was really where I started to find my calling. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Once you surround yourself with other people who think it's possible and then are actually doing it, then you're in a whole, whole nother level of possibility. Exactly. Yeah. Sometimes it's, it, I, I find that people need permission to be themselves. Mm. If that makes sense, like they they grow up being told how to be, so they're, they're wearing, I guess, in Philip's language, a mask to to hide who they really are. And then when they see other people doing 
when they see other people who are aligned, who are being authentic, who are just being themselves, it's almost like, oh, that's cool. I can actually do that. And it takes a lot of courage because sometimes it's scary and, and to be vulnerable and to be authentic. And yet that's where all the magic happens. Mm. I still feel sometimes like we're in a bit of a privileged uh, space in terms of that awareness because most people aren't. Most people, and it's not that uh, most people are still on the treadmill, still going through the motions, right? And 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 haven't. I feel lucky that I've, I've bumped into enough people or put myself in enough places where I had the opportunity to say, I'm not just going to keep doing my sales job and making lots of money, and, and and there's actually another level of happiness beyond this, and this isn't happiness at all it's just uh, an existence that i was having before well there there are currencies that are way more valuable than money and part of the problem is that people don't understand that yeah where if you are aligned you have way more energy and energy is a currency right um I, I'm, I'm a word geek so i love these things and the word current or currency means current it means something that flows mm. and Energy is one of them. Respect is one of them. Things that uh, think of any phrase where you you use the word pay, which paying means like paying money, but you know pay attention or pay respect or there's there's a lot more. There are a lot more currencies, and time is the most valuable one. How you know you're only given a certain amount of minutes and, and seconds every day. How do you invest that currency? Mm. That's huge. I mean, somebody somebody was uh, illustrating this point to me the other day, and they said, you know, some put a multi billionaire on his deathbed and ask him how much he'd pay for another year of life. You know, they'd probably give you whatever you want, all of it. We 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 are so blind to how much of that currency we waste in terms of time, right? So I no longer watch TV. I no longer waste time. And part of that wasting time is because you're trying to avoid something you don't want to do or whatever that looks like. I Part of my healing process has been to have the most insanely structured daily routines and rituals. So every Monday looks the same in terms of structure, every Tuesday. every And I take Fridays off as a self-love day Yeah, where you know I get a haircut, a massage, I watch a movie in a theater. Um, I have this whole thing I do, and I hang out with people I love. And then every Sunday is adventure day with my son. So I don't work on those two days. And I, even though it's insanely structured and routine, I actually have a lot more time to be productive and to be creative and free time. I have so much free time. I, I don't glorify the word busy like I used to. Like so many people are who are successful, they're like, oh, I'm so busy, as if that's a good thing. And people will say, well, what are you doing today? And I'll say, oh, nothing. <laughs> yeah. They think I'm insane. Like right now, I'm planning the biggest event I've ever produced in my life, uh, which is a hundred times bigger than what I'm normally used to doing. And every day, I have three, four hours where I can hang out with people, take a nap, watch a movie, whatever I want to do, because it's part of my routine. Um, and I finish the majority of my work by 10 a.m. And I have this awesome routine where I get up at five and I, I exercise, I meditate, I strategize, I journal. All by the time most people start work. Yeah. So you, in terms of your morning ritual, um, you've consolidated down an eight-hour workday into three or four hours of focused effort, basically? Uh, yeah, so to break it down a bit, uh, from... Let's say six to eight is when I do most of my brain work. So thinking, strategizing, planning, writing, where I need my brain energy. Mm. Uh, and then most of my calls and meetings are in the afternoons it's from three to six. So I have the time in between for in-person meetings or lunches with um, clients or friends or coffees, whatever that looks like. So it's really organized. And I don't waste time. And wasting time could be checking Facebook every 10 minutes or it could be checking email. Uh, I have very specific times for all these things. 
and half my business is run on Facebook. So it's not like I'm not on it. However, I'm efficient. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only way I've, I've managed to, I mean, I've used some of the online tools where I can block out Facebook and stuff like that, but there's so many workarounds. Um, <laughs> for me, for me, I, I've just had to force myself into siloing, you know, one of the big things is I want to create content, but when I post it, I don't necessarily then want to spend an hour reading what all the updates are. So I, I like to kind of post it and then switch it off again and, and consolidate my reading to one part of the day, you know? Um, and email is the same thing. And I, I've talked, touched on this before, but I know some people talk about, responding to every email on their phone and they just kind of, you know, the Ohio method only handle it once and just delete and respond and be efficient. But for me, that mental distraction, um, and Cal, I, I listened to an interview once with Cal Newport who talks about deep work and he was essentially saying there's like mental residue when you switch tasks and go back to another task. Um, and so I find if I just check it on my email quickly, then I've put something in my head that now I'm going to think about and it's totally distracting. So, um, you know, and this going back to the, the Tim Ferriss inspiration, the four hour work week, which was a big part of how I set things up for me is, you know, he talked about having an out of office and getting to check email, you know, I think once a day and then once every few days and, you know, being super efficient that way. Exactly. Yeah, and you know what? I feel like um, there's this phrase "ego depletion." I'm not sure if you've heard that before, and it has to do with brain energy. And you can think of it like if you've ever played a video game where you have a life meter. You know, you have 100 percent energy or life, and then as you're beat up, your energy goes down. Mm. I that's how your brain essentially works. So every time you have to make a decision, you use up some of your brain energy. And right. If you use it up all, you know, before the end of the day, the decisions you make at the end of the day aren't probably very smart. Right. And for a lot of people, for me specifically, up until January, I had, I was, um, like I'll, I'll, I'll say this since January 1st, I've lost 50 pounds. Yeah. And part of it was because of the, the awesome structure I have where I don't have to make decisions. I know exactly what's going to happen. So I don't have to think. And by not thinking, you save up that brain energy to make decisions like, you know, don't have a sugary snack at 9 p.m., yeah. which is something I always do because it was, I was brain dead, I guess, yeah. <laughs> right at the time. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I've I read a book by uh, Kevin Hogan, which talks about, he talks about um, units of willpower and you only have a limited amount of units of willpower in a day. Um, but exactly the same thing. I was terrible for it when I'd get home from work and eat my dinner and then nine o'clock at night, my favorite thing would be to like break out the rice krispies and have a bowl of cereal right before bed. Um, but yeah, if you don't, if you're making too many decisions during the day, then you are going to eat the bar of chocolate at nine o'clock at night and it's going to be hard to stop. So, uh, absolutely. I want to, wanted to switch it up a little bit. You've, you've, uh, mentioned, Archangel a couple of times. I wonder if you could kind of explain it for, for the listeners. Um, I love the way you explain it, kind of like the X-Men thing as well. So maybe you could do that. Sure. Yeah, so I've built an entire business modeled after the X-Men comic book story where in the X-Men, Professor X, who's the leader of this superhero group, looks for people who have, in the storyline, a mutation, which they believe is a curse because um, they can do extraordinary things. And he shows them how to use that gift or use that power as a gift to make humanity better or save people's lives, whatever that looks like. And I've, you know, the people I've aligned with are entrepreneurs who are successful, but their main driving force is creating impact, is making the world better. And I, I look at them like modern day superheroes. Mm. So my role is to talent scout these superheroes and connect them together and curate them and make a community of of these mission driven, heart centered entrepreneurs who want to make a big impact and money at the same time and use the money they make to help make a bigger difference. So that's, you know, Archangel is essentially a community of these type of people where 
it started off as an annual event, a private mastermind um, high-end event in Los Angeles. And now we have an online membership group, and we're doing way more in terms of uh, branching out. So, you know, we want to create like a school. Uh, we're doing more events. We're doing a big event in the fall, every September in Toronto for thousands of people, where the entire event is a fundraiser. And then all of the money raised from the fun- from the event goes into a fund, which we can then use to offer micro loans to entrepreneurs who are growing their business or donations to charities. And, you know, for this year's event, we have some major massive speakers like Gary Vaynerchuk and Robin Sharma and Seth Godin. And eventually some kind of online school will come. And I have my book launching in the fall as well, where all the money from the book goes into the fund as well. So there's a lot happening. Mm-hmm. What are some, uh, some examples of, uh, are there some examples of people that you've given to who have kind of done stuff for that money and, and built businesses so far? Yeah, for sure. So one example, uh, Chip Franks, who's started an organization called Joe Volunteer, which is or will be an app that connects, like Uber, an app that connects um, organizations that need volunteers with people who want to volunteer. Because when, when, when you want to volunteer, sometimes it's very difficult to figure out who needs you. So his, what he wants to do is create an app, and he's already done it. He, they're launching or they're beta testing in Austin right now. Uh, to help local organizations that need help find people who want to help. So that's just one example of someone doing something amazing. Yeah, that's very cool. And so what's, what's next in the evolution of that work for you is you've obviously you've fully exited real estate now. And I know, um, I know I wanted to ask you cause it came up in the, in the notes here, but you went on uh, a retreat to Ireland with uh, with Philip McKernan, who I seem to talk about quite a lot on this podcast, but because um, he because he's an influential man. Um, but so what what revelations came out of that for you in terms of kind of shaping the future? The biggest one for me, I believe, was the program programming I had in my head, you know, as if I'm a computer that being selfless was the best way to be. And that came from my childhood, from growing up in churches and from how my parents taught me to be. And and I discovered that being selfless was very selfish because it destroyed me. When I always put other people before me, I wasn't taking care of myself. And what I learned was that by putting myself first, I can lead by example and not only with my peers, but also with my son, which was, I guess, the biggest one for me, mm. right? And and taking care of myself and taking care of my happiness uh, allowed me to show or allows me to show my son what I want him to do because I would never want him to put other people first. I want him to take care of himself. And the same goes for everyone that I surround myself with. So I think this is Philip's line, you know, being selfish is the most selfless thing you can do and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have a, a, a beautiful example of that in my life as well, because, you know, I thought I was being, I thought I was doing the right thing by delivering the money and putting my kids in private school and et cetera, et cetera. And then, you know, my, I, I came out of my, my big job and started kind of building a side business in real estate and took the kids out of real estate, uh, out of private school rather. Um, and then one day my son said to me, or he brought home this piece of, uh, work from school. And on the piece of work, it said something like, um, my dad helps people and he has a podcast and he helps people with fears and anxiety. And, and I was like, that's, you know, I couldn't have, you know, they, you, you think of the term like lead by example. I mean, that, now putting myself first in terms of my, you know, my mental health, my physical health, helping other people. That's the best teachings I can ever give my children. Exactly. So yeah, totally on the same page. I love it. Um, where can people find you online, Gio? Apart from Facebook, obviously. <laughs> so giftedentrepreneur.com is the name of my upcoming book and it's the blog right now. 
um, archangelsummit.com is the September event. Mm. So th- those are the two places right now. Yeah. And I'll put those in the show notes so anybody listening, you don't have to try and spell it properly. You can just click click the links and enjoy um, well, I'd love, uh, you know, I'd like to just say thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I love the stories. I love your points of view. I feel like we're, we're synchronized in our thinking in a lot of places. And, um, yeah, it just feels, it feels very good. So thank you. I, I truly appreciate you inviting me. Thanks, Tim. All the best, my friend. You too. Bye bye. There you have it. Giovanni Marsico. I told you he was a special character, right? Um, Dr. Xavier. <laughs> yeah, it was fun talking to him. It's fun to witness what's going on in his world in terms of somebody who's got a vision and they're implementing it day by day and listening to him talk about his structure and the way he kind of sets his life up. You can see why. You can see why he's making things happen. He's being intentional every day of his life, right? Um, if you have any guest suggestions, so show suggestions, or you want to just say, hello, Tim, Go to the contact page uh, at anxietypodcast.com, send me a message, connect. And if you want to also become part of the Less Anxiety, More Life community, you'll find a button for that on the website somewhere on the front page. Um, And that will allow you to join our Facebook group where we talk about a variety of stuff and support each other and ask questions and all those sorts of things. So have a look, get involved, and let's get started. And remember, until next time, less anxiety, more life. Thank you for listening to the Anxiety Podcast. For more information, go to theanxietypodcast.com.